Hello friends, uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, we are in rather uncertain times right now. I hope you and your family uh, is safe and you're all staying indoors and I hope you have access to everything that you need at this point in time. So uh, in today's panel, we're gonna talk about how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting waste and recycling in USA. A couple of weeks ago, we had a similar panel that uh, discussed the waste management effects um, during the time of COVID-19 in UK. And next week, we're gonna have a more global perspective to this topic uh, in another webinar. Uh, today's webinar is moderated by Cole, who's a senior editor at Waste Dive. Cole has been a long time uh, contributor on Be Waste Wise. He has also moderated a panel for us in the past. And uh, discussing with Cole, we have David, who is the executive director and CEO of uh, Solid Waste Association of North America. We also have Robin, who is the president of Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries. And before I hand this over to Cole, just a gentle reminder to all of you, we, we, the panelists will be taking your questions. So please use the Q&A section and uh, share your questions as soon as you have them, because Cole is going to take the questions as and when they come up. So over to you, Cole. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so yeah, no, no surprise. The the pandemic has been very disruptive and challenging for the U.S. Um, waste and scrap industries, like like every part of the economy. We at Waste Dive have been doing our best to track it over the past month or so, um, finding effects ranging from you know, uh, as commercial business winds down, volumes have sh shifted and folks on the residential side of our industry are dealing with um, much more strain and much more challenges than usual as, as everyone is stuck at home. Uh, another area that we're gonna cover today is of course um, health and safety, what this means for the workers in these industries who are essential and continue to go out and do their jobs at a time when um, it's challenging to even go buy groceries right now. Um, and over the past month or so, another area we'll touch on as well is just a range of uh, short-term policy changes to try to adapt to what this means. Um, some curbside recycling programs temporarily suspended, some other um, state recycling policies being shifted, uh, among many other factors. But I'll leave it to our great panelists uh, to help walk through all of that today. So to start off, um, we'll start with you, David, and for folks who may not be familiar with SWAN, I'm sure David will talk more, but you know, they're the leading um, public and private sector voice really in the US waste industry. So David, when this all started, I would say early March at the latest, but I imagine it was on your radar before, um, when, when did you get the sense there's gonna be a major issue for your members and what did the first month or so look like for SWANA as you responded to this? Well, first of all, Cole, thank you to uh, Be Waste Wise for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Um, and I want everybody who's participating to please uh, stay safe and healthy, you, your families, uh, and your fellow employees. We're obviously in a very challenging time. Um, it's not every day we have a global health, um, public, a global public health emergency, and we're in one. And so above all, everyone should stay safe. Um, I would say it was mid-February when we began to, to pick up signs that uh, we needed to be preparing for um, some pandemic here in the United States, that there were, that there were concerns being raised um, it, it, at, with a few people in the public sector, with several people in the private sector. Um, it became a topic of conversation in uh, my interactions with government agencies. And as I was traveling, particularly in February and into the early part of March, uh, there was this increased concern that this was going to be the last trip I was going to be on for a while. And that actually happened when I went to Utah in very early March. Um, so we've been preparing for this, which was one of the reasons why we were able to uh, put up a web page with useful resources and interface with the federal agencies relatively early uh, because we, th this wasn't something that caught us by surprise. I think the the breadth of the shutdowns at the state level um, was a little surprising. Um, I don't know if I, I personally anticipated that, you know, the majority of Americans were going to be on stay at home orders by April 1st. Um, but I do think that um, the industry has responded really well. Um, as we'll talk about, we're an essential uh, service and uh, the changes in um, operations and the changes in the waste flow um, have required companies and local governments to be nimble 
and make changes in their own operations. Thank you. And yeah, no, I, th I think the, the timing of everything that happened with the shutdowns really did catch a lot of folks by surprise, even those who were the best prepared. Um, and turning to you, Robin, I'd imagine, you know, Esri being so plugged into global commodities markets in the way you are, you, you know, we're hearing effects from China and other countries earlier, but um, walk us through what this looked like for Esri, you know, in these early months and how you've been responding. Um, okay, just wanted to make sure the speaker was on. Uh, the time frame for us was very similar to what David described. Um, I was also doing a lot of traveling in February and starting to hear that um, the global connections were really going to start shutting down and travel was going to start shutting down. And we were hearing, actually, we were scheduled to um, have a trade mission to Indonesia and Malaysia at the end of February. And so we started wondering, okay, should we, is it really smart to do this? Should we continue? We had 25 members that we were gonna be traveling with. We had meetings lined up with uh, government entities and uh, uh, recycling operations and consuming operations throughout that region. And about two weeks before we, even though there hadn't been occurrences in that region, of COVID-19, we started getting the signals that this just, it wasn't smart. We, we were actually worried about being stuck in the region, um, that there would be a shutdown wherever we were. And so we canceled that. And that's when we started looking inward, what are we gonna need here in within the US to help the industry? And then certainly in early March is when everything just it's, it seemed like overnight. Um, as David said, I think we were all surprised by how quickly the states reacted and the stay-at-home orders. And so our uh, focus quickly shifted to three priorities to help our members, to help the uh, recycling industry across all the commodity areas. First of all, helping them stay in business uh, to keep open, recognizing that um, recycling is essential um, it is a critical part of the supply chain for um, manufacturing of the goods and services that are needed in this kind of an emergency, everything from toilet paper to hospital beds, et cetera. Um, but also just as important is that it should only stay open, the operations should only stay open if they could do so safely. And so helping our members determine how do you operate safely consistent with CDC guidelines um, at this time. And then third um, was help supporting our members and the industry overall have access to federal and state uh, support because this has, and I know we'll talk about this in a couple of minutes, but the economic impact has been uh, very deep within the industry. And so uh, it's particularly cash flow has been an issue. And so helping our members in that area has been important as well. And, and before I turn it back, I, I was a little bit uh, remiss. I should have started by wishing everyone a happy Earth Day. Today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And it's actually um, with everything happening in this world today and the global impact of the pandemic, it's a particularly good day to pause and think about uh, what we can all do to um, help make sure that this planet that uh, we give to our children is as um, beautiful, safe, and um, resourceful as it was when it was given to us uh, years ago. And so I wish everyone a happy and safe Earth Day today. No, a uh, good note to, to make for sure. Yeah, 50 years. Um, and I think to that point, I, for Earth Day and other, other you know, um, coverage in such in recent weeks, folks have really been realizing how essential these these sectors are, you know, and the, the role they play in uh, environmental protection and just in keeping, you know, keeping our, our cities running. One, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a big part of what your trade groups like yours and others were dealing with in these first couple of weeks were just getting that essential designation, right, from federal agencies, state and local. Right. I'll admit having not, you know, covered a I guess we're really no one's dealt with a disaster at the scale before, but you know, my sense was, you know, that those mechanisms mechanisms were in place for say other natural disasters, other factors. It, it surprised me a bit that it did take such so much time for the waste and recycling sectors to get recognized and that that had to be such a laborious process. Um, 
David, I know that was something you were dealing with a lot. Walk us through, you know, why, why is this something that the government had to be reminded about? And do you think maybe now going forward, this is the time, you know, we'll have dealt with that? So I agree with you that it was really important to get clarification for the waste sector to explicitly be mentioned in various state orders, and in particular, the federal guidance that came out in mid to late July. Um, we're not first responders, um, you know, and the waste and recycling industry is, um, you know, somewhat overlooked at times. You know, police and firefighters, they get a, a, a lot of respect and it's very well deserved. Uh, but sanitation workers um, are, are right there behind them. And particularly during a pandemic, um, when people are at home, it, it becomes more important than ever for sanitation workers to be able to go out and do their jobs. And that's not just on the collection side, but that's at the processing facilities, as well as at disposal. Because um, if landfills, for example, weren't allowed to be open, um, you would see the system back up very, very significantly. Um, there was an article actually out of England where apparently that has happened to some extent. And as a result, um, they have what, a, what they refer to as fly tipping, a lot of illegal dumping taking place because people need somewhere to dump their trash. So we spent a fair amount of time making sure that the waste sector was included in um, all the relevant state and federal guidance. Um, to my knowledge, it has been very explicitly and um, in certain states, it's, it's written quite broadly to include uh, supplemental activities um, that support the waste sector, like maintenance and contractors and things like that. Um, so we're pleased by that. That's good to hear. Um, Robin, do you feel like, you know, have, have the various um, scrap recycling sectors been adequately recognized at this point, especially because they play such a vital role in the supply chain? Yeah, it's, uh, there's good news and bad news here. The good news is, um, as David said, we jumped in very quickly and we're working both on the federal level and the state level to um, ensure that recycling operations were recognized as part of critical manufacturing. And for those in the know, people know in the manufacturing industry and, in, and throughout the manufacturing economy, the critical role that recyclables play. We supply actually 40% of uh, the feedstock that's needed for manufacturing across um, all commodity areas and around the world. Um, the, the challenge is that those who aren't familiar with manufacturing don't understand that and think of it as waste material. And so what we were really focused on was trying to highlight um, the role that the commodities play in the manufacturing supply chain. And uh, everything from 70% of steel manufactured in the US comes from scrap. Uh, when you look at, everyone thinks of toilet paper these days, 58% uh, of the feedstock into tissue mills is recovered fiber, scrap paper. So giving that kind of data and making sure they understand it. The good news through all this is that um, every state and the Department of Homeland Security on the federal level recognized scrap recycling as part of critical manufacturing. The, I don't want to say the bad news, but the weakness or the challenge has been that those not in the know don't understand that. And so that's why, like David, we were fighting to um, try to get that designation as explicit as possible and not inferred because we even had an incident, uh, there's only been a handful, but some incidents of uh, local law enforcement stopping workers on the way to the recycling operation saying, no, you're not essential. And so having to um, make sure that it's explicitly outlined so they can say, yes, I work for recycling. Recycling is part of critical supply for manufacturing. And I think there is an opportunity going forward once we're out on the other side of this um, pandemic to actually build on the statements that have been said and the recognition to really raise awareness about the role of recycling and how essential recycling is to the economy. That's good to know. Um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the worker factor. Obviously, that's you know top of mind for for both your groups. I know as well as other folks in this sector. It even under best case scenario, it's a challenging job. Can be a dangerous job working in various parts of these industries. Um, David, we'll start with you on this. What have you seen in the first however many you know one to two months now, just in terms of how the workforce has been affected? We at Waste Dive and other media outlets have seen there are 
of course, confirmed cases among the workforce. There sadly have been some deaths of um, industry employees. But do you have a sense that it's been a widespread challenge? Is, is the workforce relatively stable at this point? Um, I think that many frontline workers are concerned. Um, this is an unknown danger and a new potential hazard. And so there's some misinformation out there. Um, unfortunately, um, m hundreds, m perhaps many hundreds of solid waste collection workers and others in the solid waste sector um, have tested positive for the coronavirus. Um, the majority of those appear to be in the New York City area. And Cole, as you said, there have been a number of deaths, unfortunately, in um, Pittsburgh, Raleigh, and the New York area. And um, Swana and myself send our, our condolences not only to their families, but to their fellow workers. Uh, because of these concerns, um, Swana really tried to emphasize the worker safety aspects of this, uh, really above everything else. Um, so, the, you know, the first guidance we put up on our website actually was the guidance from the experts in the field, the CDC and OSHA, uh, regarding the types of protections that frontline waste collection workers need to stay safe. And they, uh, those agencies uh, conc have concluded that the regular personal protective equipment, uh, particularly gloves, will insulate workers from exposure to the coronavirus. Um, there are a number of pathogens, unfortunately, that can be in trash and on recycling. There's, um, that's been true for, for decades. And if you're wearing PPE, that prevents you from uh, getting exposure. However, because of the uh, great variety of concerns, a lot of companies and local governments have been taking uh, measures to in in create additional levels of protections. So for example, at facilities, there has been social distancing between workers. You're no longer seeing groups of drivers get together for a toolbox talk or for a safety meeting in the same room. Um, there's been um, some social distancing uh, at the MRF, where it used to be that at recycling facilities, uh, people, pickers, would be standing side by side, removing material from the line as it went by. And there's been some social distancing created um, in an effort to uh, reduce exposure. Some collection companies and municipalities are taking steps to reduce the interaction between the driver and the helper. A driver and a helper in the cab of a truck are not six feet apart from each other. They're four, four and a half feet apart from each other. And so some are uh, allowing the helper to drive to the beginning of the route, get on the side of the truck, work the neighborhood, go back to his vehicle or her vehicle, and then move on to the next neighborhood. In some organizations, um, the driver or the helper is being driven by a supervisor um, to the garbage truck. So there's a number of measures that are being taken uh, to enhance social distancing. And I think it's really important for um, workers to not be potentially exposed to the pathogen, to, to the coronavirus, um, in, in the material itself that they're handling. So that means consumers need to be told again and again to put all their material that they're throwing away in the trash into a bag or into a cart, but that all of the recyclable material being generated at curbside needs to be in a container. People should not be putting loose material out on the street. So that box from that e-commerce company um, that had 24 rolls of toilet paper in it, that should be folded up and put inside the blue bin. And if you don't have space in your blue bin for that box, save it for the following week. Definitely good notes and things we're hearing from a lot of folks out there in the sector. Um, Robin, is there anything you'd want to add on that about, you know, how this has been affecting members in your area um, and, and access to protective equipment in general? You know, are, are folks feeling they have sufficient access right now? Yeah, no, um, I would uh, just, there are a couple of distinct, I think, things happening in recycling versus in waste. First of all, interestingly, we have um, not been hearing of a lot of cases of COVID-19 within the recycling side. Um, they're uh, pretty early on. Well, first of all, ESRI did issue some safety guidance to our members, and we've had a number of forums to exchange best practices, et cetera. We also um, saw a lot of recycling operations very quickly close down the retail side of their operations. 
and do everything they could to minimize uh, contact with customers, create social distancing. Um, in terms of pers uh, personal protective equipment, we also um, saw from the start there was the determination that although a lot of our operations had been using like the N95 masks, um, under OSHA guidance, uh, the N95 masks are actually not required for a lot of the operations and instead they could use other forms of face masks. And so a lot of our operations have actually switched to other forms of uh, respiratory protection and they are actually been donating the N95 masks to first responders in the area. So we're seeing a lot of donations of PPE to hospitals and other facilities out of the recycling industry and I'm really proud of that activity. But at the same time, certainly within the operations, gloves are critical. Um, face masks, social distancing. Also, we've talked about possible engineering controls to increase air circulation. So there are a lot of steps being done um, within operations to ensure that um, all the employees are safe. I would also note that the basic hygiene practices are equally applicable in our operations as they are in your own home. So putting up posters for your workers to remind them to wash their hands, clean surfaces, that's as important as everything else we're talking about. Yes, good note. Please wash your hands, everybody. It's, uh, it needs to be reminded all the time, for sure. Um, thank you to folks for putting in questions. We appreciate that. Um, just a reminder to please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we're gonna start working in some of these questions to our discussion. Uh, so one that is certainly interesting, and I think it's it's hard to know the long-term effects of where this is all heading, but just uh, generally, what are what are some early trends that either of you are looking to, that either you think could be changes in your industries or you're watching to see potential changes going forward? I know one particular interest um, to us in Waste Dive this week and in the coming weeks is, you know, the financial uh, stability of some of these companies as has been referenced, you know, can folks make it through this? Are, are the loans and the grants going to be enough if business stays quiet for as long as it does? What else are you watching, David, going forward? So I think there's at least two things that are going to be very different going forward as a result of the COVID-19 situation. First of all, in the, in the universe of occupational health in the waste sector, there's always been a focus on injury and less of a focus on illness, right? There's a lot of um, potential hazards out there and people get injured a lot, but they don't get illnesses a lot. When people are reporting to OSHA on their OSHA 300 log or they report their TRIR rates, uh, total recordable incident rate, it's always about injuries. And I think this pandemic is going to shed some light or shine a brighter light on the illness side of that equation and what employers need to do to uh, protect their workers from illnesses. And so I think that's going to be one of the longer term ramifications. The other one that I would mention, and this really pleases me, and I'm sure it pleases others in the industry, is the recognition that the sanitation industry in general and the humble sanitation worker on the front line is, is finally receiving for the essential work that they do. There's been a, a number of national media reports focusing on a particular garbage collector whether it was uh, the PBS NewsHour show earlier this week or CNN several weeks ago, which Swana had a hand in helping with. Um, there's been any number of these really remarkable stories about the, the individual who goes out day and night and collects the trash, not knowing what's in the trash, not knowing that somebody might be generating COVID-19 and that you're touching that person's trash can. And I think there's going to be um, more respect given to the waste industry in general. And I think that's good for the image of the industry um, and good for retaining workers and attracting them into the industry, which call, as you will recall, three short months ago was the biggest issue facing our industry. Yeah, labor shortage was, uh, it feels like a distant memory now. It's uh, very, very different times given the unemployment rates. What are you, what are you looking at, Robin? What's, you know, what's on your radar as possible um, long-term and near-term changes? The truth is, I don't think anyone really knows. Um, there's so much uncertainty. Um, and uh, I mean, one of the, the 
basic of, uh, uncertainty right now is how long this is going to last. And I think the focus really is what you mentioned early on, which is um, just making sure that um, businesses will make it to the other end of this. Uh, there has been so much disruption on both the supply and the demand side for the industry. And that has caused certainly an economic downturn within the industry, as it has across the manufacturing sectors and across the economy. So we're not unique in that respect, but there have been layoffs. We're, we're anticipating based on some economic modeling that already we're seeing about a $2 billion um, economic loss within the, within the industry. And how that is going to, um, to transform itself over the coming months, we don't know. And supply chains are affected not just domestically, but um, around the world. And so our concern, our focus has been doing everything we can to keep the businesses viable and to help them with cash flow issues. Glad you mentioned that. It's, yeah, as, as it's in the news right now, we were, you know, expecting uh, the latest package to get passed by Congress possibly today. Um, but there's, I saw a story that some folks think even this new money could run out in a matter of days. You know, the demand is so high. Um, and I guess we'll just have to keep watching to see if there's enough there or, or like you said, depends on how long this lasts. I guess that's a real factor. And if I could add one thing, I, I think what's, yeah. um, one of the things that is very unique about this downturn and, and um, I've been with ISRI and, and in the recycling industry for more than 30 years now. I started when I was five. Um, but um, I've seen downturns before, but this one really is unique. And uh, not only because of the depth of it, but because it is hitting all aspects of the chain, supply and demand at the same time. We're seeing the manufacturing contraction, but there's also because of changing patterns in consumption, as well as where we're consuming products, it has it really impacted what's flowing into the industry. And uh, so I think we have to do everything we can to remind everyone who's listening here about the, the need to continue to recycling. Recycling is essential because it supplies manufacturing. Yes, it also benefits the environment. It is a socially the right thing to do, but it's also just a critical need for our economy. And we need to keep materials flowing. Even your aluminum can, one of the most recycled products and packages um, worldwide, that isn't flowing um, at the levels it needs to. Um, we need to encourage people to still recycle, to still put their recyclables into that curbside bin. Um, and although there's definitely been some concern about uh, the possibility of COVID-19 remaining on, the, on these packages. There was just a study last week from the New England Journal of Medicine, which talks about how long actually uh, the virus will stay on different surfaces. And the truth is that at the concentrations, it stays on those surfaces, it's very, very low. And you wear the gloves and you will remain safe. Please continue having those materials flow into recycling. Gotcha. And I think that's a good segue actually to, into another um, question we've received. And I'll turn this to you, David, because it involves the public sector. Um, you know, we have seen a, a, admittedly a smaller number of local governments, but some who are suspending curbside recycling or collecting it, but not processing it. Um, in addition to that, are there any other, you know, local government strains you want to call out specifically? I would think from a financial standpoint, this could be a challenge for budgets as well for some of their programs. Absolutely. So uh, a, a number of local governments have suspended curbside uh, recycling collection or yard waste collection and or uh, bulky waste pickup. It's primarily because um, local governments have uh, lim some limited resources and want to make sure they pick up the trash that's being generated on a regular basis, particularly when residential volume is up, you know, as much as 30% in some, in some places. Um, so we have seen suspension of service in, in, in a number of areas. Um, there is no doubt that the increased residential volume, which local governments have to dispose of at uh, disposal facilities often operated by the private sector, is um, impacting budgets. And so we're paying more to get rid of the 20 to 30 percent more residential waste that many communities are seeing. And so local governments are having to make difficult decisions about 
uh, continuing programs. And so, for example, the New York City Department of Sanitation has uh, announced that it will be suspending certain programs um, in the next fiscal year. That's just one of many examples. But another operational change is occurring at the uh, drop-off centers. So you have all these Americans who are, you know, at home with more time on their hands, and it's the springtime. And so people are engaging in a lot of spring cleaning, and they're, uh, they want to bring things to the Salvation Army and Goodwill, and they want to bring stuff to the local drop-off center. Well, the Salvation Army and Goodwill are closed, as are most of the donation locations. And so people are flooding into drop-off centers. Um, earlier this morning, I actually received an email from a SWANA staff member who participated in a county uh, meeting yesterday and um, reported that there's been a 70% increase in the number of customers going to that very large county's uh, drop-off centers to, to the point where um, people are getting unruly because they have to wait online and the county has had to bring in security to keep order and keep social distancing. So there is no doubt that there's gonna be uh, a significant impact on many local government's budgets. That's one of the reasons why SWANA has submitted a letter, to, a letter to FEMA asking for FEMA to consider providing funding to local governments and others who are incurring additional costs uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've actually had a very productive conversation with FEMA about that and um, are hopeful that they will look favorably upon the request. Interesting. Yeah, it's um, this, I guess, goes into yet another of our uh, viewer questions. We appreciate all the questions coming in, folks. Um, you know, at a time when the where and how people are recycling or managing their materials is shifting, the broader commodity markets are having some pretty interesting changes right now as well. Um, so I'll turn this to you, Robin. You know, oil prices being all over the map, fiber prices on the rise, uh, international trade being restricted. What does this mean for, you know, some of the, what are some, I guess, key commodities you would call out as having particularly notable moments right now? Sure. Um, and it does vary by commodity, but overall, uh, the, Plum the Bloomberg Commodity Index is reporting that um, uh, prices are down on average about 25% year to date, but we've seen dramatic differences from commodity to commodity. If you look at steel, for example, um, steel, the, the uh, although again, we're seeing both supply and demand issues, on the demand side, uh, one of the biggest factors is just the contraction that's occurring. Steel mill utilization rates are down around 56%. I think that's the latest figure, whereas this time last year they were at 80%. Um, so there isn't as much of the demand pull on the steel side. If you look at paper, the bigger issue, although again, both supply and demand issues, the biggest, the bigger issue is actually on the supply side. It's getting those, those cartons into the recycling bin. Um, we need more and more paper into the mills. The mills need the material in order to produce the toilet paper, the packaging for food, et cetera, that we need uh, for this economy, even during this time. And we're seeing OCC prices, for example, go from a low of, I think it was $20 or $25 a ton earlier this year to $75 now. So demand is up, but supply is down. Uh, with regard to, you mentioned oil prices, what's happening with oil prices, that's causing um, significant problems on the plastics in that resin prices, virgin resin prices were already uh, very low. And now we're seeing uh, obviously a deeper impact. So it really does vary by commodity, but overall it's definitely down. And there is a concern about how long this will continue. Interesting. Uh, I'm turning well, to well, another trade. Oh, oh yeah, I please just, I just want to add to that. The, um, particularly because today's Earth Day, it's, it's important to note, uh, to add on to what Robin just said, because the amount of material coming out of the commercial sector is so much less than it was months ago because so many businesses are closed. Curbside recycling has become more important than ever as feedstock for the various uh, markets. Um, as a result of that, prices have, for fiber have gone up. As, as, as Robin accurately said, cardboard pricing is up and people are looking to get cardboard. But because nobody's buying cars, you know, metal isn't uh, in the same level of demand and nobody's buying carpets 
right now. So, you know, some of the feedstock for that is, is plastic. And in addition to that, um, eight of the 10 states that are bottle bill states have suspended the enforcement of the requirement that the retailers redeem bottles. And the majority of the cullet, the, the little pieces of glass that are used to make new glass comes from bottle bill states. And so um, we are facing some very unique, unusual shifts in both supply and demand for material. Um, and we're gonna continue to engage with ISRI and our other partners to, to make sure that the supply chain uh, remains as robust as possible. And, and also to build on that, uh, although we've been focused domestically, uh, this is a global economy. And when you look at recycling overall in a typical year, and obviously we're not in a typical year, um, but between 25 and 30% of the recycling that occurs within the US actually we are, uh, produces recyclable products, specification grade products that are sold into the export markets to steel mills, foundries, paper mills, uh, plastic refiners around the world. And we typically sell to 150 different countries around the world in any given year. Think about what's happening now. The shutdowns are global. And we have port closures. We have so much that's disrupting that global movement. And so that's further affecting the demand side and causing disruption throughout the recycling chain. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. It just seems to be so hard to know where this is all heading, you know, day-to-day, uh, -day, week to week. And that gets to another question we have from one of our viewers, actually, in terms of, you know, how could one even begin to forecast uh, financially what this means for recycling? Say so you're a municipality trying to understand if you have, you know, how much revenue you have, may have coming in, or if you're a service provider trying to figure out how you're going to price this service um, looking the next few months, let alone the next year or so. What, what would either of you recommend right now in folks trying to guess where this is going financially? Uh, well, we're really fortunate at Israel. We've got uh, two economists on staff who are constantly monitoring the markets and uh, also talking with to others within the investment and economic community to understand where things are headed. Again, as I said earlier, it, it's really, um, we're in such uncertain times. It, I don't think anyone can predict um, accurately exactly where we're headed. But at least having the knowledge of what's happening today is critical and staying on top of current trends. And I encourage anyone who's listening, please feel free to visit our website. We keep a lot of this information right um, on our website, the latest information about where markets are headed, what the predictions are, et cetera. It, it's all available. And if anyone has any um, questions, they can feel free to reach out to me directly as well. If I could just add on to that, um, I think the crystal ball isn't just cloudy, it's been shattered. Um, I, I told a reporter a few days ago that if anybody's making predictions with certainty about what the economic climate is going to look like six months from now or what the recycling market is going to be um, looking like six months from now, um, they, they, they may be smoking something. Um, we're, we're in uncharted territory here and we have to recognize that. But as Robin said, we have to mine the data, speak to the folks in our networks, work together as an industry to try to help the companies and local governments uh, respond to this and mitigate the harm just as quickly as possible. We're likely in the deepest recession we've had since the Great Depression, the, the worst economic downturn, at least in my lifetime. And so we're in uncharted territory here. Um, we're gonna recover. We don't know how long it's gonna take to recover. And we don't know yet whether it's a V-like recovery or a more gradual recovery as we had coming out of the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009. Um, it's very difficult to predict what the price of uh, OCC is going to be six months from now. It would be folly to try to make a place a bet on that at this point in time. But I would actually, going to something that um, David just said and Cole, I think you hit on earlier, when you asked about um, what is what we're looking at what we think is going to happen down the road and is there any good that's coming out of this i think one of the good things is that we are all working together uh you know I, i've been talking with david and other organizations and we've been talking with our counterparts overseas and uh sharing information sharing best practices talking about what we're observing so we can although that crystal ball is broken there's no doubt about it 
uh, at least we can be smart about what's happening now and what, what we can do to help move things forward and make sure that recycling is strong when we come out of this. And we will come out of this. Recycling is resilient. The recycling industry is resilient. We've had downturns before. Yes, this is uh, one of the worst we've had in a long time. Um, but we will come out of this. And we will, recycling will still be there. And we're going to make sure that it's as strong as possible. Gotcha. Um, one more on the trade front, and then we have um, a variety of questions on, I'd say, zero waste topics as well as labor topics that we'll, we'll aim to get to. Um, I'll turn this to either of you, whoever wants to take it first. Any sense of whether the disruptions have been less notable on the domestic front in terms of trade between the U.S. and Canada, be that for uh, scrap commodities or perhaps for you, David, um, waste moving you know across the border? I know in some uh, Michigan, for example, can take some waste to their landfills from Canada. What are we seeing so far there? So I'm not aware that uh, there's been a disruption in the movement of waste across the U.S. Canadian border. Um, I believe that waste from Ontario continues to move into certain states in the United States. Um, and I just was on the phone yesterday with somebody in Michigan who re referenced the line of trucks on one of the bridges uh, coming over um, from Windsor to Detroit, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so I think that trade continues. But Robin, you probably know better than I do about that. And actually, I would say that um, many people may not realize this, but Canada is actually one of our biggest customers for uh, recycling and for recyclable commodities. And that material is continuing to move, certainly subject to the same supply demand issues uh, that we're seeing domestically, but the material is still moving across the border. That's good to hear. Um, turning to, uh, I think this gets at a couple of the questions we've had, and I'll treat it a little more broadly, do we get a sense still that, you know, some of the, the many circular economy goals from governments and corporations are still in play? Uh, for example, we've seen, you know, some uh, pilots toward reusable containers get paused uh, at the retail level. Any Anything to call out there that you're seeing so far about how this could change the pretty robust commitments and goals a lot of folks had in the last couple of years? Um, it's definitely quieter. Um, but I can't imagine those goals going away. And I know speaking from the recycling industry's perspective, um, as much as we're focused, as I said at the beginning, on those three key elements for the industry, you know, making sure that recycling operations continue to operate and they're recognized as essential, keeping them operating safe and providing support and assistance. We are still um, addressing the underlying issues in the industry and supporting the industry. And one of the ways that we're doing a great example is just this past week, actually, our board approved a new um, recyclability protocol that uh, the recycling industry, ISRI, will be developing, which will focus on helping determine um, what paper-based packaging is recyclable, actually developing the protocols for testing. Um, as brands and manufacturers come out with new statements and new packaging products and new packaging designs, this will be a standard that will help determine whether or not it truly is recyclable and can make it through the MRF, through the recycling facility, through to the mill. Um, so we are still all looking forward and still looking at the circular economy and ways to strengthen and improve recycling. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that. Um, I think that we've put the pause button on some of the circular economy zero waste initiatives while we re react to this unprecedented situation, which we should rem remember is only in its really second month globally. Um, and I don't think that we're hitting a stop button on any of those things. And I think that um, we are transitioning from what I've referred to as the shock and awe phase where, oh my God, everything has changed. And now transitioning to something that is becoming a new normal and will be evolving over time as businesses reopen. And I think you will see um, increased attention uh, paid to circular economy, zero waste efforts, reduce, reuse, recycle efforts um, that had been quelled as we were dealing with the very real public health and worker safety issues associated with COVID-19. I don't think those efforts are, are, are in danger, the, the, the sustainability efforts. I think that we just hit the pause button on them to a limited extent because there are other temporary priorities. Correct, correct. Gotcha. 
Um, and to build off that, I'll turn this one um, to you again, David, actually. Um, we have a, a viewer question about how that would apply to food waste uh, goals specifically, right? We've mentioned that New York um, has temporarily suspended its curbside organics program for the upcoming fiscal year. I personally am not aware of any other municipalities doing the same, but do you get a sense that, you know, organics collection is largely still occurring on the, on the food waste side, not the yard waste side? Um, I'm not aware of a number, a number of uh, organic food waste programs being shut down. It's interesting that, that you raised that question. I actually did a call yesterday with the uh, executive director of ReFed, who I really consider to be the leading organization around food waste and food loss recovery. And we discussed the fact that uh, so much food at the farm level is not making it now to um, people in need. Um, you know, a lot of the food supply chain goes to restaurants and schools and businesses. And because those businesses are closed, farmers are literally plowing their food into the ground. They're um, breaking millions of eggs every week. Um, and there was a very, very uh, in-depth report on this um, in the New York Times uh, about 10 days ago. I think we need to revitalize our food waste and food recovery efforts, both because it's the right thing to do, but especially now with so many Americans out of work, with so many people in need, I think there's this great opportunity to create new supply chains from the farm to the food banks so that people can get the food that they need. Um, I, I don't know exactly how we do that. There may be a federal role in helping make that happen, but I would think it would be very politically popular for uh, farmers to be supported in this way to have the produce and the crops that they grow that they're planting right now. Um, I literally got an email from somebody earlier today telling me he had to go plant his corn. Um, not a SWANA member, by the way. Um, so there really is some urgency in, in creating the infrastructure that we need to get food from, from farm to table for people in need. Noted. Um, in thinking about it looks like we're you know nearing the end of our time here, so we'll just kind of wrap up with a couple final themes. Um, I, I like what you said, David, about you know the shock and awe phase is seeming to we're shifting away from that into into the new normal. One thing I think some some of our um, viewer questions are getting at, and I know folks are still wondering this in general, is you know will that mean we can all get on the same page in terms of labor safety? Being you know, is it safe to touch the material? Are are we all uh, you know following the same guidelines? We're seeing some questions here about is you know, is, is PPP uh, appropriate for this um, this time? What else is happening to the workforce? I'll turn this to you. Do you feel like, you know, some of the early changes that were made to maybe close facilities or reduce, obviously we're gonna keep the social distancing and no one's saying otherwise, but as far as the, the physical contact, is that, are you seeing kind of a, a more general consensus around how to handle that now? So I think there's been a consensus that PPE is sufficient to prevent exposure to the virus from the waste. I think there have been concerns uh, from a variety of, of worker-related organizations that you know, were, were, were concerned about that, but I don't think the science supports the idea that um, if you're wearing a glove, you're going to be exposed to the coronavirus because you take a container that's containing metal or plastic or cardboard and dumping it in the back of a truck. It's my hope that uh, none of the people that nobody is exposed to the coronavirus through the waste. We're monitoring that quite closely. We're in contact with a number of organizations tr trying to get information about how people have been exposed. Um, it, as best we can tell, none of the fatalities that occurred to folks in the waste industry occurred due to exposure from the waste. In fact, several of those people were not, most of those people were not frontline workers. And so um, it's our hope that there will be some consensus around the federal guidance and the, the types of information that both ISRI and SWANA are putting out around how to properly handle this material and also around social distancing at fixed facilities. It's like landfills, transfer stations, and recycling centers. What are your thoughts on that, Robin? You know, it's, we've seen concerns about hand sorting uh, in the recycling side, for example, a minority of cases, I'd say, but that's, that did lead to some facility changes and closures. Um, do you, are you getting a good consensus on your side of uh, side of things? Yeah, absolutely. And, and similar to what David said, I don't think anything um, has changed with regard to the recommendations for wearing gloves 
and for other personal protective equipment. And we have not seen any cases of um, the virus spreading at any recycling facilities. None have been reported to me. Uh, facilities are following safe distancing, um, social distancing, and that needs to continue. I mean, we've all heard the news that this is not a two month issue that this is going to continue into the foreseeable future. And so it's really important that all of us, ISRI, SWAN, and all our organizations continue to reaffirm the message about the importance of safe operations and what that means at our facilities through training, through uh, posters and other information that's provided to the workers. And if we continue doing that, we're gonna maintain a safe workplace. Gotcha. Um, well, as we wind down here, I just have one or two more things I was curious to hear about myself, and then we'll also, you know, as, as time permits, get to some more questions. Um, one thing that came to mind for me, Be Wastewise, of course, is um, an international platform, right, and, you know, brings folks together from a wide range of countries, and there's always a lot of great panels about what's happening. So, you know, since we're sort of on the, the later end of the curve in terms of experiencing this compared to some other countries around the world, um, have you gotten any good resources from your international counterparts, you know, other, other trade groups or global trade groups, any, any lessons or any maybe hopeful signs of countries that are, you know, farther ahead than we are right now? Well, I know from the recycling industry side, we've been working very closely with our counterparts in countries around the world. As a matter of fact, the Bureau of International Recycling based in Brussels has been bringing us together, all my counterparts again in countries in Asia, in North America, South America, Europe, together on um, probably like every other week, we have calls to share best practices. And we're all pretty much aligned um, in terms of what we're experiencing uh, and also the curve in terms of uh, just sharing information about messaging on recycling is essential. And you know, it is interesting. It doesn't matter what country you sit in, the basic issues are the same, it's the exact same. And the safe operations and the recommendations for best practices are the same. Um, and so it's really important to continue that dialogue and have that conversation. I'm sorry. Um, just to add on to that briefly, uh, Cole, you're right that we're you know, ahead or, you know, behind other countries in terms of the, of the curve. It's only by several weeks, really, from Italy and Spain. And so um, I don't think we uh, got a lot of lessons learned from other countries about how they're dealing with the virus from a waste and recycling perspective. In fact, um, I know that our um, guidance materials that are on our website have been translated into Portuguese and Spanish and are being used in Latin America. And we've been in contact through ISWA, the International Solid Waste Association that SWAN is the national member of, with people in a number of countries to provide them with guidance about how to deal with various aspects of that. Again, I think it's just too early um, in, the, in, in the, the trend to, to be able to take information from other countries and use it here in the United States or in Canada. Um, but I'm hopeful that you know, as we learn lessons about this globally, we'll, able, we'll be able to scale them and apply them locally. Yeah, what can hope. Um, in, in our final minutes, I think maybe we'll try to do something of a, a lightning round, you know, just quick responses. Um, and I'll jump in only if you feel uh, you have an answer. I won't put you on the spot. Just that we appreciate all of your questions. And so we want to help folks out here. Um, in terms of dealing with, uh, there's a lot of gloves and masks being uh, littered on the ground in communities, uh, either dealing with those or um, dealing with just PPE in general that is, you know, has been used after the shift, what would be the recommendation on the best way to handle that? Well, over the last two weeks, the topic that I've been speaking about the most to the uh, broadcast media about has been the incredible amount of litter that we're finding um, in parking lots, uh, on the street, in parks, that's plastic gloves and masks. And it is incredibly disappointing that people are being that cavalier and tossing things out into the trash, not even tossing them into the trash, just throwing them away, even though there's a garbage can usually within 50 feet of where they're standing. And it's a public health issue. It's an environmental issue. Again, the reminder that today is Earth Day. So part of our Earth Day messaging that we're sending out is the importance of making sure that if you're discarding a plastic glove or, or mask, that you dispose of it properly, which by the way means in a garbage can, not recycling. 
We're seeing an uptick in the amount of that um, personal PPE uh, showing up um, in recycling facilities. It's even though it's made out of plastic, it's not recyclable and curbside. Yeah, David and I are both part of a network with uh, the US EPA, with Keep America Beautiful, a recycling partnership, and a number of other entities um, to coordinate Earth Day messaging. And as David indicated, this is one of the key messages in Earth Day, which is the importance of disposing of um, discarded PPE. That's good to know. Um, just from my own understanding, would that apply to workers as well? You know, is there the, is there certain types of PPE that are considered, you know, only use one per shift or can some things be reused if they're cleaned or sanitized properly? There are certainly some um, gloves that are, for example, reusable um, and other PPE that may be reusable and should be uh, cleaned before next use. But I think for your average, uh, your average citizen, they're using the disposables and those need to go into the garbage can. Gotcha. Okay. Um, one other quick one from our, our question feed here. Any sense of uh, increasing attention toward automation? you know, at certain types of facilities or certain types of collection. It's something I'm hearing anecdotally, but I don't know if that's, you know, on your radar as a, as a major trend. Yeah, I, that is, that's a trend that's pre-COVID-19. Right. We're seeing increased use of robotics throughout the recycling industry, and that will only continue. Um, so that is something that uh, we're continuing to share information about with the industry. And um, I would imagine that we're going to see more and more use of robotics and other automation uh, throughout the industry in the coming years. So while I agree with Robin that uh, automation was an important trend on the, in the recycling side of the industry pre-COVID-19, one of the reasons for that was because the unemployment rate was 3.5% and it was virtually impossible to get workers. Um, with an unemployment rate in double digits, um, there may be, I'm not saying there will be, but there may be less of a financial incentive to engage in capital spending, capital investment on robotics when you may be able to hire people um, to do that work. So that's something to watch. Interesting. Um, in closing out, you know, our final minutes, I'd like to turn it back to each of you one more time just to highlight anything it's coming up on your radar, you know, that you think folks um, should be aware of or should be watching in, in the coming weeks from your organizations and, and where they can go to find resources as well. Um, Robin, let's start with you. Sure. Um, again, ISRI's website is um, isri.org, and I'd encourage uh, folks, especially today on Earth Day, uh, to go to our website. There's a lot of great information. We have, just as I know Swana does and others, a COVID-19 resource page, but a lot of great information on keeping safe. Um, information on what's happening in the states, what's happening on the federal level, global market trends, um, as well as information on um, assistance that's available through federal and state resources. So uh, please look at that. And, and if there's any closing information I would leave is that um, just to, rem to remind everyone that recycling is essential. We need the recyclables in the supply chain in order to produce the hospital beds, the toilet paper, uh, the facilities that are needed, um, and the products that are needed for our first responders, as well as for all of us as we're in the stay at home mode right now. So please keep recycling and most importantly, stay safe. So, um I'm gonna pick up where Robin ended. The most important thing is for everybody to please stay safe and, and your families and your coworkers. Um, some of the things that SWAN is watching is, um, we've had some anecdotal reports that some uh, private and public sector uh, organizations are having trouble getting hand sanitizer and uh, may be low on certain PPE. So we're trying to encourage um, the federal and government at all levels to make sure there's adequate supply for these essential workers. Um, as I mentioned, we're working on trying to get FEMA to cover the increased expenses associated with um, the increase in residential garbage, as well as the fact that some of the service that's being provided is being provided to businesses or others that are going bankrupt and may not pay for the work and whether there's an opportunity to get uh, recover money for that. Um, 
We're also beginning to think about uh, federal policy opportunities here. Um, as people know, um, recycling has been under pressure for, for several years. And there's been some talk now yet again about a federal infrastructure bill. And perhaps there's an opportunity to provide some federal support for recycling in particular in a federal infrastructure bill and perhaps for food waste um, along the lines of what I was referring to earlier in terms of getting waste, getting food from the farm to the table. Um, and I guess the other thing to keep a close eye on is, uh, you know, there's been 18 to 20 new facilities that were scheduled to come online in North America, paper mills and plants that would be receiving plastic, recovered plastic. And that was going to add millions and millions of tons of capacity that would support domestic recycling programs. And that was one of the reasons why SWANA has been cautiously optimistic about the future of recycling in the United States and Canada. Whether or not the current downturn, economic downturn in the pandemic uh, causes uh, problems in bringing those facilities online, um, delays them, or perhaps forces their cancellation is something we're going to be watching very carefully. Uh, I wish everybody a very happy Earth Day. And uh, SWANA's coronavirus guidance is on our website, which is swana.org. And I want to thank uh, Be Waste Wise yet again for inviting me to participate in this. Thank you very much. Thank you both so much. We really appreciate the discussion today. Um, and of my own brief closing remarks, uh, we obviously had a lot of questions we couldn't get to. If folks, and as I read a lot of them, I think it's information that's out there, and I'd be happy to engage with folks if they want to find us at wastedive.com. You can find my email right there and happy to point in the right direction um, for various resources. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainty these days, and we're all just working through it together. So be very busy in the weeks and months ahead, I'm sure. And thank you to Be Waste Wise as well for the opportunity to have this dialogue today. I'll turn it back to you, Swetan. Oh, thank you, folks. Thanks to all of you for being part of this panel. We had a very short time to put this together, but uh, this, was, this was absolutely great. And thank you to the audience for all your questions. Like Cole mentioned, uh, we could not, I think the panelists could not answer all of them because of lack of time. So we are also available at connectedwastewise.be. We will be happy to direct you to any, either of the, any of the three panelists and uh, they will be happy to engage with you as well. And do head to ISRI and SWANA's website and, as well as Waste Dive for more information because all of them have sufficient information about waste and recycling and specific to current times as well. And uh, thank you to the panelists for reminding us about Earth Day. And just one more thing, we have another panel next Wednesday, which is going to focus on the global impact, uh, where we're not just going to talk about USA, we will talk with panelists from different parts of the world. So uh, it's already been listed on our website, so you can register for that as well. So thanks a lot, folks. Uh, I think most of you are from the USA, so please have a good day and bye-bye. Thank you.